then I will be recording. Okay, well, um, certainly, I, I have talked about this topic before, but it's been a few years, so I figures I've added, I've learned some new things, as always happens, and I just want to make sure that we're, oops, what happened there? Sorry. Uh, give me a second here. Something's, just give me a minute here. I got to fix something here. Well, okay, it's not showing everything I want. Give me a second here. I've got my slide set is not doing what it should be doing. So give me a minute here. I don't know what happened. It's funny. I knew I thought that might happen, and sure enough, it did. Um, well, nope, that's not what I want. Okay. Well, I guess that's what's going to do to me this tonight. Let's see if it's doing it. Yep, it's doing it all the slides. Oh, brother. Give me a second here. I don't know why I just did this. It, did, it pulled a weird one on me. Let's see here. Hold on a minute. It's acting up and I can't, my slides are not what they should be. I don't know what happened. It's some sort of technological glitch. My apologies. Not sure why it's doing that. Just swear technology is just so fun. Nope, to do this. Bear with me a minute here. Sorry. I'm having some problems here. I know what's going on. Well, I cannot seem to get what I'm looking for. Just give me a second. Never quite had this problem, to be honest. Okay, there we go. I think I got it. All right, let's try this again. Okay, I think I got it. All right, there we go. Okay, so I have talked about this topic before, um, but it's been a while. And of course, as I said, I found some new information and I like to share that. So, um, there are some really good books online that you can get for free on this topic. Um, you can get uh, these two on the right, uh, Gary Habermas's book. If you type those in search bar, you can you can download those for free. He makes those available for free on his website, Dealing with Doubt, and then the Thomas Factor on the right. So you can get both those books for free. Um, you can just read away on your computer. Uh, the other one Bowdy, uh, by Bobby Conway is not free. You'd have to buy that one, but it's available on Amazon or whatever you want, Kindle or whatever. So those are some good sources to just get started. Um, these are some other ones. You know, these are some older ones, but they're they're okay. Um, decent resources, De Proper Confidence by Leslie Newt, this, uh, the, the guy in the bottom there, and then Alistair McGrath, Doubting, um, Growing Through the Uncertainties of Faith. And 
then we have uh wandering toward god that that's a book that came out over the last two years by travis dickinson so that's a good book um yeah that's a really good book too that that's more recent it came out the last two years uh os guinness's book is a really good book it came out a long time ago if you heard of os guinness he's a really prolific writer he's written a ton of books um that's a really good book uh the god in the dark and then uh doubt faith and certainty is another one it's a decent book so there's some good resources if you want to go deeper on this topic like i said i don't want to be the last word there's certainly plenty of written on this topic so feel free to uh go deeper if you want to uh study more on this topic screw tape letters is always a really good book um to read because you could, if you ever read the screw tape letters by c.s lewis really if you've ever read it it's about a demon um and his his apprentice and these two demons and basically they talk about their role in how they get people to think certain ways and how they get into people's minds and what their goals are and their strategies so that's a really good book to um just to read in general not just to help you with spiritual warfare things but to talk about how you know the way people think and how there is a spiritual warfare issue going on so that's a famous book i recommend it so a little couple of quotes here one is by os guinness he says here we live in an age of doubt disillusion and dissatisfaction which naturally prizes what has been described as the faith that you go to when you don't know where to go. Both our pluralistic and secularized culture has produced a fragilized self as it pertains to doubt. And that's very true. Um, we live in a very, very polarized culture, very a, a fractured culture in a way. Um, you know, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of disillusion and there's a lot of issues going on. Um, and it's just very hard for people to navigate everything because there's just so much information out there, as I'll talk about in a minute. So um, it's just the culture we live in now. Things were a lot simpler. I, I would have loved to live in the 1950s. I was born in 1968. But, you know, the way it is today, there's just uh, so much information being thrown at you all day long. And anybody can find an answer to anything online. Whether it's true is another thing, but um, but anyway, so that's a good quote. There's another good quote by uh, C.S. Lewis. He says here, "Now that I am a Christian, I do have mood swings in which the whole I have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. So, you know, we all deal with mood swings in life, and sometimes that happens to us where things uh, seem." you know, improbable, but then other times they seem very probable. So it's just the way life is. Um, but that's a good quote. I think that's a pretty good quote by Lewis. Tim Keller had a really good quote before he passed away a couple of years ago of cancer. Well-known pastor in New York, wrote a lot of books on apologetics, a lot of cultural books. Um, he was a pastor of a Presbyterian church in, in New York. I can't remember what part of New York, but he said here, a faith without some doubts is like a human body with no antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask the hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. So that's a really good quote. And it's a uh, relevant quote because I think that sometimes we, um, you know, we have some Christians sitting in the pews that I don't want to accuse everybody because I certainly don't know all the Christians across this world. Nobody does. But for some of us, we just haven't thought very deeply about what we believe. We haven't asked questions. We simply have kind of accepted the faith that was handed down to us by our parents and just kind of gone through life that way. But that can't really be sustained as the years go by. Not if you're going to, especially not if you're going to engage the world around you. If you don't want to engage the world around you and just keep a very insulated faith where you just go to church every week and that's it and you're not really engaged at all, then yeah, I, I guess that's all you need. But if you're going to be salt and light in the world around you and try to at least engage the culture on some level, 
And uh, just for your own personal benefit, you're going to need to think through some of those questions. And our culture can throw a lot at us, obviously. A lot of things come at us. When D Bobby Conway wrote this book, Doubting Towards Faith, The Journey to Confident Christianity, he's a uh, he's a pastor in, I think, North Carolina. Now, he was out in California, but he, can, he used to have a show called The One Minute Apologist. You can look him up online. He's got the best darn hairdo I've ever seen. But... He uh, he says here, when he wrote the book, Doubting Toward Faith, he said, do we really need a whole book on doubt? Is this really a huge issue in the church today? And a wor word, yes, it is. It really is. We live in a multi-textured culture that is replete with innumerable beliefs, opinions, ideas, and life philosophies. Ours is a culture of doubt and longing and faith and questioning, searching, and probing. And much of the doubt has been accelerated by fast-paced change. Our culture is living between the tension of what we once were and what we are now becoming. So that's a really good quote because he's right. We do live in a very multi-texture culture and there's a million beliefs, millions of opinions, different ideas and life philosophies, different worldviews. And it's very fast paced. And as you know, the internet is a huge issue. People are just being bombarded with information. And so it's just the way it is. And, you know, we have to learn how to navigate that, as I said. Now, when this book came out a long time ago, I think it was back in like 2010 or 11 or 12. I don't remember. It's called You Lost Me While Young Christians Are Leaving the Church. The author said in their research that one of the things that caused young Christians to kind of turn away from the faith uh, was when they said this. They said, young adults with Christian experience say the church is not a place that allows them to express doubts. They do not feel safe. It means that sometimes Christianity does not make sense. In addition, many feel that the church's response to doubt is trivial. Some of the perceptions in this regard include not being able to ask my most pressing life questions in the church, 36%, having significant intellectual doubts about my faith. So there's no doubt about it that a lot of young people do get frustrated with the churches if they go to their pastor and ask them for quite about questions and the pastors kind of blow it off or they don't show a lot of interest or they just say, well, you know, you just need to have faith and that's it. Um, that's just not going to cut it these days. And so a lot of young people have been frustrated or they go to their parents. And sometimes parents don't have a good grasp of certain things. They haven't really looked into it themselves. And Maybe they haven't had time. Maybe they've just been working too hard or working too much. I understand that. That can happen. But it, it can become very personal to parents when their kids come to them and express doubts. And then that makes the parent have to kind of dig in more in their own faith and figure out what they believe. And that's why they show up at apologetic conferences uh, asking certain people, what book should I get to give to my kid? You know, I, I've seen this happen. They'll go up to certain people and say, well, what, what's the perfect book just to give to my kid to read? And the people that I know will tell them that you don't need to get a book to give to your kid. You need to be the book, okay? You need to be the one to read the books and know how to talk to your kids about these issues. Don't just give them a book to read. I mean, not that that's terrible, but you're you should be the book, okay? So you should be reading and researching and knowing what you believe and why you believe. So you can explain that to your kids if they come to you with questions, okay? Or at least point them to the right place. Doesn't mean you can know everything, of course, but certainly you should be a safe place they can go to. So there's no doubt that it, doubt is a universal experience. Doubt's part of life, okay? For people that say they never doubt, I don't think they're being honest. And I think honestly, they're hiding it. And I also think that they're trying to be super spiritual, okay? But uh, doubt is a universal experience, okay? It, it, it does affect our relationship with God. Uh, sometimes it can be a means of stress and anxiety in our life. Sometimes it can be a symptom of a vulnerable faith. And sometimes it can show places in our, in our foundation of our faith where there's cracks and need to be exposed and need to be repaired. Okay. It, can, it exposes sometimes what's really there. What is our foundation like, right? Do we have a foundation? Is the foundation strong? Is it weak? What is it? You know, what's really there? And so I, I don't really have any problem in just saying like doubt is just part of life. You just navigate it and work through life. Okay. But some people it affects 
some some more than others. Um, I, I've certainly seen my share. I actually do it as a full time for a living. I do this for a living and help people with doubts. That's what I do um, as being a missionary apologist full time. I deal with college students all the time. I deal with others all the time. They're wrestling with questions, wrestling with doubt, wrestling with issues. So I, I kind of know the nature of doubt and what it's like. So it's just something that has to be worked through. Um, not everybody, but certainly many people, you know, have to work through these issues in different ways. So doubt is um, not the opposite of unbelief. Believe it or not, that's not what that is. Um, doubt can certainly lead to unbelief, for sure, but it's not the same as unbelief. So when you say, you know, well, you just need to believe, not doubt, that's not necessarily correct, okay? Um, to doubt is to be in two minds, as I say here. It's not simply an issue of not fully or trusting or believing God. It can be an issue of substituting belief in God for something else. That can be part of what doubt is, too. Of course, we know about the Bible being double-minded in James 1, where people are not trusting God, so that does happen. But, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen ministry leaders or people just tell Christians who struggle with doubt, like, you just need to trust God, you just need to trust God, you just need to trust God. And that just sounds very simplistic to a lot of people, Okay. Well, it may be true, and there is we do need to trust God and trust his promises. It's just, it's a little more complex than that sometimes, and we just tend to be very, we try to put these simple answers on things, and it doesn't always work that way. And also doubt can be deeply personal, because for some people, you know, what bothers one person may not bother another person, at least not to the same degree. So everybody's wired differently. Some people just respond to doubt differently. Some people get through it. Other people, it's crippling. Some people lose their faith. Other people go through a phase of skepticism. Some people, um, you know, are able to uh, just have a very simple faith where they don't ask any questions, and basically they're afraid to ask questions, possibly. And if Christianity is true, which it is, it should hold up to scrutiny. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting Christianity under scrutiny. If it can't come under scrutiny, then it must not be true. It must be kind of like a very flimsy belief or very flimsy worldview, as I say, because Christianity is a worldview. Now, as I said, some of the responses to doubt that tend to not help at all, as I've heard over the years, of course, one is you just need to pray about it. Or two, you must have some secret sin in your life. Some people just automatically assume if someone's doubting, well, must have some sort of hidden sin, right? I've heard pastors say that. Or maybe they just say you think too much. Well, that doesn't really help at all because we're creating the image and likeness of God and God made us thinkers and we do have an intellect. So and he's designed us to know things. We, we're knowers. That's what we did. We're, we're made to know. Okay. And sometimes people quote the passage where Jesus said, you know, you just need to have the faith of a child. Unless you have the faith of a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that passage doesn't mean that you're supposed to have a um, immature faith. You're supposed to have a mature faith. It means our attitude should be humble like a child, but it doesn't say we need to have a childish faith. That's not what that means. But then some people say, well, you know, you just, you need to have, you have too much head knowledge, not enough heart knowledge. It needs to sink down into your heart. So I get that. I mean, biblically, that's not really what that says. That one passage about head knowledge puffs up. It's about, you know, the heart is the totality of who we are. It's our intellect, our emotion, our will. It's all one package. So, I get what they're saying, but at the end of the day, you know, just think biblically about that because the Bible doesn't really make that dichotomy necessarily. So, as I said, sometimes uh, the things that kill Christians that have doubts, things that hurt them more, are parents or people that aren't allowed to ask questions or ch churches insulate their people. That means they don't let them ask questions or they create a climate of fear where, you know, they don't want them to step out of the church and engage anybody, 
it's just, you know, they're very insulated. And then, of course, some Christians just give very simplistic answers. So uh, those things hurt people with doubt sometimes. That can, that can just only uh, make the problem even worse. Now, it is true that it, some of the mistakes people make when they, when they drift into some sort of skepticism or atheism is that they assume over the last 2,000 years that nobody has ever asked any questions or any of the questions they're hearing. I can't tell you the number of atheists I've seen in the year said, I've got a question no one's ever thought about. And then you, know, you look at the question, I'm like thinking, no, that, that question has been talked about or dealt with over the last 2,000 years. So it's not really a new question. So sometimes you just have to ask, you know, are these really new questions? Have you ever looked into all the answers that Christianity has given to these questions for the last 2,000 years? And of course, sometimes people, um, you know, as I say here, number three, some people just need every question answered exhaustively. They need like an absolute certainty on every single thing, and they don't feel comfortable till they get it. That's what we call Cartesian anxiety. It comes from Descartes. Um, study Rene Descartes look him up, study him. But, and then some people obviously are looking for reasons not to believe, you know, some people that if they start to doubt and start to ask a lot of questions, maybe they're looking for ways to get out of Christianity. You know, there could be some cases they have found a moral issue that they don't agree with, with Christianity, something morally they don't agree with. And then they use other excuses like, well, you know, I've got all these other questions, you know, the Bible's not trustworthy. I don't think we can know Jesus rose from the dead, blah, 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 blah. But really the bottom line is there's a moral issue that they're dealing with they don't like. And so they're, they want Christianity to, um, you know, they don't like the moral implications of Christianity. Now, it's true that, as I said, that access to the internet has made it so anyone can Google anything. And in many cases, people don't take the time to ask if what they're reading or watching is credible. All the, the younger generation, they say 30, the 30 and under crowd, the majority of their information comes from TikTok. They say statistically, that's where they're getting most of their information, which is really troubling. Because TikTok is not really a great place to get information, especially about God. So, but the younger crowd, the 30 and under crowd just are on TikTok perpetually. And that's sad, but that's... Um, that's what we're living in these days. Of course, other social media feeds as well. So the problem with the internet is that, well, it's true you can get some information on there that could be good. There's also a lot of bad stuff on there, and people just don't have the discernment um, in what they're reading. They don't have the, they just don't have the background or the, uh, you know, the tools to navigate everything on there. So. That takes some time, and so that that obviously happens all the time. People on the internet finding stuff that causes them to doubt. Obviously, you can find anything on there. Really, look up anything. Now, there's a book called "In Search of a Confident Faith" by J.P. Moreland and Klaus uh, Isler, and a couple of things they say. They say if you're not confident in some of the some of the tenets of our faith, meaning something about Christianity then they say, you know, perhaps it's time to buckle down and study instead of just being lazy and just being, oh, you know, I don't understand this. I'm just going to chuck it. You know, I'm just going to kind of just take a break from God or not embrace Christianity anymore. You know, if you're going to take a lazy approach, then that's on you. But sometimes it takes hard work and sometimes you got to buckle down and study whatever that issue is. And there is a there is a positive gain if you dig deeper. I've seen I've seen people that are willing to dig deeper, and I've seen people that won't dig at all. Um, they simply will not put in the time and effort to look into the answers to those questions they have, or look into answers to those doubts they have. So, yeah, that's that's a moral. Sometimes that can be because of a. You know, it, it's laziness, but also it's just the will. The will is not there. The will is not in the right place. They don't, they're just, there's a barrier in them wanting to uh, commit to really uh, know what God is saying about this topic or know that there's an answer out there. And, you know, it's just like if I, if someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm just not that confident in how to share why I think Jesus rose from the dead, which is fine. I don't 
I'm not going to say, how dare you? You should know that. No, that's why there are resources out there. That's why there's so many resources out there. There's so many resources to so many issues these days, so many resources that the apologetic community has provided. If people will just take the time to do a little more homework. So, you know, I would hand this book to someone and say, why don't you read it? And we'll talk about it. But, you know, there are resources out there on on various topics that, you know, if you want to be more confident in a certain area, how to talk about it or how to explain it or just for yourself, you just say, you know, person, just personal fulfillment, personal knowledge, there's resources out there that can help you. And so in some cases, um, what you see with some people is they go through these phases where they have like a doubt and then they fall into despair and then they just depart. It means that they just depart from Christianity. Um, I personally, you know, I, I'm not going to get into eternal security in this call, but I don't think it's that easy just to leave Christianity. So just to say, ah, I'm just going to break up with God and go about my way. Um, I don't think that's easy. It's only breaking up with a girlfriend or boyfriend. So when it comes to these things, some people, um, there's, there's a big movement now called deconstructionism. And that's where... People that are raised in the church or raised in Christianity, they go through this process where they deconstruct their beliefs. You know, deconstruct means to take apart, right? And so they go through this uh, process of questioning, doubting, and then sometimes they might end up rejecting the Christian faith. Um, some people stick with it. You know, some people deconstruct it and then reconstruct it, which is fine as long as they have the tools to do that. Um, but there is this movement I hear with some people, you run into them, I deal with it sometimes, be like, well, I'm deconstructing, I have to clarify what they mean, like, what are you deconstructing? Are you just trying to figure out what you believe, like, figure out, you know, why you're a Christian and why Christian is true? That's not deconstructing, necessarily, that's just asking questions and doing apologetics, figuring out what you believe, why you believe. And, you know, some, some of them, um, you know, some of them, as I said, some of them have the right tools to reconstruct, but some of them, obviously, they want to deconstruct to, to actually that may lead to the destruction of their faith. Just depends on who you're talking to. But I have run into some people that are doing this. Um, but anyway, that's that's maybe some of you have not run into that, but some of that's out there if you stay around long enough. That's all over the internet too. Now, what about some of the people that? Maybe, you know, there's always been stories of people that left atheism for Christianity or else you have the vice versa, people that left Christianity for atheism. You know, this this has happened over the centuries, like you you have popular level atheist speakers who say they were raised in a church and claim to be a Christian and now they're atheists. Um, and sometimes then they go after Christianity with a vengeance. This has happened for a long time. It's not really anything new, but you know, it doesn't really matter because every time you read about someone like this, these guys, you, you, you also have a slew of former atheists that became Christians and are very influential today. Um, so in the end of the day, I don't really find either one of those things really compelling. Um, you know, the testimonies of those that say they left atheism for, or the testimonies of people, you know, why they switch beliefs. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, let's just look at the evidence. What is the evidence for Christianity? Is it true? Um, so I don't really get really overly excited when I see people switching back and forth. You know what I mean? It happens, but I mean, I don't. And I'll listen to what they say, but it's not something that's going to be an overly convincing thing to me. It's not something that's going to make me be like, hey, okay, this makes Christianity true. We just need to look at Christianity itself and weigh the evidence. Now, it is true that, um, you know, for people who have questions, they're just asking questions. It doesn't necessarily mean they have doubts. What if you're a new Christian? You say, I don't understand the Trinity. I don't, it's most some people that are adults have been Christians for a long time, don't even understand the Trinity, don't know how to talk about it, don't know how to explain it, don't know how to articulate it. It doesn't really mean you're doubting. It just means that you don't, you just have questions, you know, like how would I, 
I don't quite understand this or that. And I need, I need to really bulk up in this area. I need to figure out what I believe about this. I need to study harder. That doesn't necessarily mean you're doubting. It just means that you're trying to, you know, resolve a question. So it's like William Lane Craig here. He says the secret to dealing with doubt and the Christian life is not to resolve all of one's doubts. One will always have unanswered questions. Rather, the secret is learning to live victoriously with one's unanswered questions. So there's some questions that will never get answered exhaustively. There's things that we won't know exhaustively. We are limited beings. God is the only infinite being there is. We'll never understand him 100% or exhaustively. He's revealed what he wants us to know through creation and through the Bible. And that's all we need to know. We don't need to know anything else. Um, and that's obviously, and he thinks that's enough. You know, if you want to know who he is, what his plan is for our life, what he expects of humanity, then you would have to look at creation and then look at the Bible. And so also every belief system out there has questions. Okay. Every worldview, atheism has questions that aren't answered. Different religions have questions that aren't answered, different philosophies, so every belief system has questions, okay? But just asking questions doesn't necessarily mean that you're doubting. Like if my kid, if my son or daughter would come to me and say, Dad, you say the universe ca is caused by God, but what caused God? You know, does that mean they're doubting? No, I just think it means they have a question. So, you know, you have to be able to allow questions, and don't get frustrated if you can't get every question answered exhaustively. Now, there is, believe it or not, there are some positive things about doubt, as much as we may think it's terrible and sinful. Um, but doubt certainly can prevent us from reaching hasty conclusions or making commitments to untrustworthy sources. So sometimes you suspend judgment, like you say, I'm not going to commit to that thing. Until I get the adequate evidence, I'm not going to commit to something until I, I research it. Um, now, obviously, you can't always withhold making judgments forever. Sometimes you have to commit, right? You don't have time to just sit back and be doubtful forever or be skeptical forever or hold back judgment. That's the way it is sometimes you're witnessing to people. You know, some people want every single question answered, they think, until before they're going to commit to Christianity or commit to Jesus. And that's just not going to work. Um, you're not going to get every single question answered before you make a commitment to Jesus. That's not the way it works. And it is true that <clears throat> there is, you know, a form of, I call it common sense skepticism, which means that, you know, we can be skeptical of things, of some things we hold back judgment, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But then there's, like I said, the, the, the other side is hyper skepticism. And that's where we just don't we'll commit to something until we have complete exhaustive knowledge. You get every question answered. And that's probably not, that's not the way you work through life. Life doesn't work that way where you don't make any commitments until you get every single question answered. That's just not the way life works, as I'll explain later on. So some people, you know, they do want kind of an exhaustive understanding. They want an, like an exhaustive knowledge and they have a hard time living with tension some things are not cleared up precisely the way they want. And, you know, if I'm studying God's foreknowledge in the Bible, he knows everything, but then he gives man free will. I don't know how those two points meet like perfectly, like how they work. I just know the Bible teaches it, but I, I'm never going to get that resolved completely because that's just a mystery. I don't know how God knows everything, but yet he gives us free will at the same time and how those two things, you know, integrate with each other, work together. I don't know. I'm not completely ever going to understand it, but that's okay. So, like I said, some people, they just don't like any gaps of knowledge. You know, they want everything figured out, everything buttoned up, and it just sometimes it doesn't work that way. Now, you know, do we say, you know, when people have faith, as if, you know, does faith mean to have 100% certainty? Um if you think about biblical faith, faith it's not faith is not to have the highest degree of psychological confidence. Um, you know, because you're talking about well, how you how you think in your mind, like, do I does this jive with me psychologically? Um, but 
you know, when you guys make commitments, we make commitments in life. We don't have always have the highest level of confidence. We have some confidence. We have maybe a decent amount of confidence, but sometimes we don't get the exact highest level of confidence that we need sometimes before we make commitments. It's just the way life is. Um, if you're, you know, let's think about it. When you're trying to figure out what to do, make a decision, sometimes, you know, you gather more information, think about it, gather more information, think about it, gather more info, think about it, gather more info, think about it. It just goes on and on sometimes. And then it comes to the point where you just got to make a decision. Decision has to be made. And, you know, you, that happen, uh, that applies to everything, it applies to religious commitments it applies to job commitments it, it applies to relationship commitments um eventually you'll have to make a decision so you may not get every single question answered exhaustively as i said but for some people it's hard because i, I feel like you know some people out there faith is like a house of cards and so if one card gets removed as you know that whole house collapses and for some people, their faith is like a house of cards. Everything, every card has to be in place perfectly. And if one card gets, you know, um, gets a little shaky or gets challenged, and then that one card falls, the whole house falls down. Um, and so, so for some people, it's like an all or nothing approach. So it's, that's a very tricky thing to navigate. Okay. It's, I mean, it's a very tricky thing to have like a house of cards, you know, as your faith. Now, this is a little um, philosophical, or maybe just helps you, but I'll give some analogies here. So just let me give explain this. So we have faith, we have Christian faith, we have biblical faith, um, which is trust in God, right? That means trust. It means uh, fidelity to God. It means um, fidelity or commitment, trust. We... You know, the point is that you can know something without being certain about it, okay? So let me give you an example. If you look down number two here. So you decide to get married, you take a job, okay? You get your fiance. At this point, someone says to you, are you sure about this? Are you sure this is the right person for you? Are you sure this is the right job for you? You can say, in many cases, many of us have said, I know this is the right person for me. I know this is the right job choice. But even when you say that, you say, I know, you may not have the highest level of certainty that you want. You may certainly don't have absolute certainty. And you may still have some unanswered questions because you don't know how everything's going to work out with that spouse. Anything can happen. Um you don't know how that job's going to work out. The job, maybe the company falls apart. Maybe you get fired. Maybe your health goes bad. Maybe the job has a different boss and you don't like the boss, the one that hired you. And then you have to quit because you don't like that job or don't like that boss. So, but you still said at one point said, I know this is the right job for me. Yeah, this is the right one. Or I know my fiance, this is the right one. But you still had to take a step of faith. You had to take a step of commitment. Okay, without 100% exhaustive certainty. You know, every day, number three, you know, look at number three. We believe every day the government won't collapse, which it may, but we generally believe the government won't collapse. You believe you'll graduate from college, get a decent job, own a house someday, whatever. There's all kinds of things we believe, okay, without knowing, not without, without having 100% certainty. You know, but we could say that I know I'm going to graduate from college. I know I'm going to get a decent job. I believe I'm going to get a decent job. I believe I'm going to graduate from college. You know, we we interchange, we inter, use those words interchangeably sometimes. But um, the point is that you have to have faith at some point. You have to have the faith to step out and make commitments without having all the questions answered perfectly. So when you think about biblical faith, um, we talk about believing faith. Believing faith is cognitively active. It means that it is something you believe in your mind. It is, you know, it's a function of your thinking. But, you know, if I say, I believe my spouse is the right one, that's something in my mind, right? 
Now, trusting faith is different. Trusting faith is our will. That's where we step out and we make the commitment. Okay, so if I first find my fiance or spouse, future spouse, and my mind's telling me this is the right one, this is the right one, I'm using my mind, or this is the right job, this is the right job, I'm using my mind, then I still have to take that step, step of trusting faith, where you step out and commit, right? And that involves your will. That involves you exercising your will, right? If you never exercise that, you won't do anything in life because we have to make all kinds of commitments, right? You know, it's like I said, you know, you go to get wet married one day if that happened or maybe it didn't happen, but you have knowledge that your spouse is the right one for you, but you still have gaps of knowledge and there's some level of uncertainty because you can't see that far into the future. Only God can. You, you don't know what's going to happen. You really don't. I mean, there's a million things that could happen, but you still take a step of faith and you commit. Okay. That's why some people, you know, some people won't be married. They just, they can't make that commitment. It's too scary for them. They want to know everything about the future. It's uncertain and they're not willing to take that step and that's okay. So there's nothing wrong with that. So anyways, it is true also that all Christians are doubters. You're like, I'm not a doubter. Doubt's wrong. I don't doubt anything about God. I don't doubt anything. Well, you're definitely doubtful about every other religion. You're doubtful that Mormonism is true. You're doubtful that Islam is true. You're definitely doubtful that atheism is true. Probably spiritualism, Hinduism, Buddhism, anything else, right? And so that's why you doubt the, uh, you hold back judgment and you don't commit to it, right? Because you're just, you don't have confidence that it's true. You don't have a level of confidence that any of them are true because you think there's all kinds of problems with them. If you looked into them enough, there are all kinds of problems with them. So, you know, if a Muslim tries to convince me that Islam is based on a true revelation, that Allah revealed himself to uh, Muhammad back in 650 AD, 600 years after Jesus or so, and a Muslim tries to convince me about that, I have a lot of doubts about the, the revelation of Allah to Muhammad. I have a lot of doubts that that really was a revelation from God. If, you know, if I have all these first century and second century, third century documents that tell me Jesus was crucified, and then a book comes along in the 600s telling me that Jesus wasn't crucified, that it was somebody else, because that's what Muslims believe. They believe that God made it look like Jesus on the cross, but it wasn't, it wasn't Jesus. So Allah allowed the disciples to be deceived. They thought it was Jesus, but it wasn't really Jesus. And then according to Muslims, for the first six centuries here, all the way up to the sixth century, everyone was just deceived. We thought Jesus was crucified, but he wasn't really crucified. It was somebody else. I am not going to have confidence, or I don't have confidence in that revelation as being from God. I think it's actually a false revelation. So I have plenty of doubts about it, and I think they're well-deserved doubts. So I'm not going to commit to Islam ever in my entire life. So, because I don't think it's a true revelation of God. But see, see how we use doubt as a tool to evaluate religions, other religions, we do it all the time. And that's, of course, as some people do with Christianity as well. Now, there is people, there are people in the Bible that doubt it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. People in the Bible doubt it. it the Bible's filled with doubters. Um, you can look at Peter when he after he'd already seen Jesus do some incredible things, he still doubted in Matthew 14, you know, when he's about to drown, you know, on the, on the water and Jesus wants him to walk to him. And of course, Peter doubts and it shows Peter was wavering. You know, he didn't, he was doubtful that Jesus would sustain him right on the water. Um, we know the Pharisees obviously doubted Jesus's Messiahship. They asked him for another sign in Matthew 12. And, you know, Jesus says at one point, if you have faith in God and do not doubt, you have prayer. Your prayer can move mountains, right? If you, you can receive your request through prayer. There's also that passage about John the Baptist when he's in prison. He'd already seen Jesus baptized. He'd seen Jesus do incredible things. He was Jesus's forerunner, right? Announced his coming. 
But then John's in prison. He's about to be beheaded. And he actually says to Jesus's followers, or John the Baptist sends people to go to Jesus and he says, you know, go to Jesus and ask him, are you really the one who's to come? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one? Remember, John had just seen him do all this stuff. He saw the Holy Spirit's baptism on Jesus. He saw the Spirit of God. He saw the, the dove come down, the voice, everything. But he, now he's doubting who Jesus is as he's about to be executed. Right? It's pretty amazing. And you also can see at the resurrection encounter that when Jesus appears to Mary, Mary goes and tells the disciples that she saw Jesus and the disciples don't believe her. Then Jesus appears to two others. They tell the disciples they saw Jesus. The disciples still don't believe them. So they doubt the resurrection appearances. And then you have... Um, You have Thomas, of course, who, you know, really had to actually see Jesus's wounds. You know, he doubted it that much. He said, I will not believe till I touch his wounds, put my fingers in his side. Now, Jesus didn't se severely rebuke Thomas. He didn't say, Thomas, you doubter. You are the worst disciple I've ever had. You lack faith. You stink. Go away. You can no longer be my disciple. He said, Thomas, touch, believe, believe, right? He gave him what he needed, and Thomas needed that, okay? Now, a lot of times we talk about different kinds of doubt. There's what we call emotional doubt, factual doubt, and volitional doubt. So I'm going to bracket these, what they, you know, how they, they fall under these categories, what they mean. Now, it is true that some doubt comes from weak foundations. As I said, there's the foundation is not really as strong as it needs to be. And, and people, you know, sometimes we really struggle and we tend to maybe be easier, more susceptible to doubt. You know, our foundation includes, we definitely include strong discipleship, accountability. You know, we need people in our lives. We need people speaking in our lives. We need strong mentoring we need strong relationships of course we have our devotional life where we need strong bible study and reading we need a vibrant prayer life um, serving god and being active in a local church is important where we're rooted in a community where we can help others they can help us we can serve others they can serve us we can serve with our spiritual gifts then of course apologetics and a good theological foundation is important that we know what we believe, why we believe that we have that brick in our foundation. So, you know, you can work on this as your foundation throughout the course of your life. We're always working on it, but you need these things to build certainly a strong foundation. And I think we probably remember the Matthew 7 text, the Matthew 27, 24 to 27, when Jesus says this, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. You know, this passage, Jesus is just hammering the issue about where your foundation is. And the reality of it is, when we go through a circumstance in life that is very difficult, we find out what our foundation's like. It will reveal what's really there. I've seen people that, obviously, they can go through tragedies and difficulties and come out with a, um, a richer faith, a stronger faith. You know, as one of my friends says, you either get bitter or better. Um, they came out with a closer relationship with God. They submitted to the trial, and God transformed them through it. It wasn't easy. It was sometimes brutal. But they came out with a stronger foundation. Um, but here's the point. You don't wait for this to happen. You don't wait for this to happen to find out what your foundation's like. The foundation should be being prepared. 
You see, your foundation is something you're working on throughout your life. So when the rain comes, it stands, your, your foundation stands strong because your foundation of the Lord is there. It's been set. It's been worked on. It's like a house. You know, if, a, if a storm comes and blows that house down, you know, you just know the foundation was not strong. It wasn't built right. Um, not that that really ever happened. Well, it gets you in like in a hurricane, of course, or something like that. But I'm saying, generally speaking, you get the analogy that you don't wait. You 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 build the foundation, you work on the foundation, make it strong. And then, you know, when that way it's ready for when the trial comes or when something comes, a storm comes your way, right? But as I said, circumstances sometimes can expose what's there. Uh, sometimes doubts come from incorrect beliefs about who God is. There's a lot of people that have doubts, wrong, incorrect views of God. They don't know the God of the Bible. They don't, they have, maybe they think God's just condemning them all the time. Maybe they think God doesn't care about them. Maybe they think God's, um, you know, terrible or he's mean or always judging. You know, they don't really know the God who is. So sometimes people have a faulty view of God. They need to work on that, um, build their theological foundation, really study and really understand the God who is, and that that can be corrected though through through just deeper study if they're willing to do it. Sometimes people doubt from questions like "Why, O oh Lord?" You know, sometimes we're going through things and we just we're waiting for the change to happen, and it seems like God's taking forever. You know, it's like why? You know, like why, O oh Lord? You know, I mean, are you really good, God? You know, it doesn't seem that you're good. I mean, I'm going through this and this has been going on for a long time. So you call out to God, like, why, why, why? How much, you know, what, what do you, how come this is happening? How long is this going to go on? But sometimes what we, and of course, like I say, we either submit to it or we don't, we either trust God or we don't, and it's hard. And sometimes you know, we need other people around us to help, help us through these issues. And then of course that falls into impatience. Like I said, you know, we, we wait for God, like just think of Israel all the times they're in exile, waiting for renewal and, and restoration. And, you know, sometimes we we just get worn out from waiting, you know, worn out for waiting for God to answer a prayer. Maybe he doesn't answer it. So sometimes, you know, that gets exhausting and we have to um, work through that issue. Turning away from God probably won't help it or just make it worse. But we have to be patient, and it's very difficult sometimes. Then, of course, as I said, sometimes there's what we call emotional doubt or mood swings, where we maybe have questions about God's presence, his goodness, or we may be encountering unanswered prayer. Um, as I said, maybe God doesn't act and do what we want, and then we don't have confidence in his love. So our emotions go up and down as they always do in our faith, because we're emotional creatures. And sometimes we, we let the emotions get the best of us. Um, so that obviously can happen as well. So emotional doubts, very common. And then, you know, we may say at times, you know, our emotions may get the best of us. We may say, you know, what if I'm what if I'm really not a believer? You know, I struggle with the same sin, the same addiction, or the same weakness that seems to plague me for a long time. I have a hard time getting victory over this. You know, that can be something that makes you doubt. And then also, you know, a child that goes through a cancer or loved one that suffers. Obviously, sickness, illness are hard things to um, trust God through. A lot of people struggle with that, no doubt about it. I've seen it happen. Um, you know, trying to submit to God through that, trying to understand what possible plan he could have in this situation seems just ridiculous at times. You're like, I don't see what good this is, what purpose does this have, right? So those, that's a form of, you know, of emotional doubt we have to definitely deal with. You know, then there's questions like, will God, you know, will God provide for my financial needs? You know what? What's going to happen? Am, am I going to be single my whole life? Will I ever be married? You know that that maybe causes you to question the goodness of God, or why did you make me this way, God? You know why do I have these struggles? Or you know maybe it's just the issue of the the uh, constant pressure to be a success to live in the realm of the American dream. 
you know, and you're not viewed as a success. And so that's something that you have fallen into that trap of measuring yourself by America's American dream standard. Um, and maybe you think, well, God hasn't blessed me and he's not good and I'm not doing as well as I want. But that's a, a faulty view of what God's purpose for you is. It's not measured by the American dream. Um, so that's those are some other things that come up. You know, in this face is sometimes, you know, people, you know, they, they think Christianity is always supposed to work like it's everything's supposed to work out all the time. And in some cases it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always solve every problem that we think it should solve. But of course, as we hopefully know, God didn't promise any of us health, wealth or happiness. That's not what the Bible promises. He promises to be with us no matter what. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. He promises as presence will be with us. He promises, he makes us promises to us in the Bible that are still there, regardless of what we do. Um, but, you know, sometimes when things don't go the way we want, obviously that can happen. You know, we just say, you know, I don't know if Christianity is really working, but what, you know, you have to ask yourself, what were your expectations to begin with? And what kind of expectation are we giving to people? When we explain Christianity to them, is it just about what God can give them? Is he like just there to be a cosmic genie? You know, sometimes we have to really explain what Christianity is really about to them because that's not what Christianity is. Just that God just is like a genie for us. We just, you know, rub the, uh, you know, what is it, you know, order him around, tell him what to do. And I think he's a cosmic genie. Um, there is, it is true that, um, one thing that will be a trigger to doubt is sin, sin certainly doesn't help. So it is true that the more we sin and the more callous our heart becomes, the more desensitized towards God we will become. So, you know, someone's struggling with doubt and they have a, a sin pattern in their life or sin patterns that are constantly there the next certainly can make the doubt problem worse and of course you know the bible warns about having a seared conscience that's where our conscience just becomes desensitized and sin will do that sin will desensitize your conscience it will harden your heart and you will not literally be able to detect god um you know you begin to doubt him more and more you doubt his goodness you'll doubt his word and it'll be a royal mess because i've seen it happen you know, the book called, there's a book called The Making of an Atheist by James Spiegel. And he says that, actually, I know him. He's a friend of mine. He's actually going to be living near in my city soon. But, uh, you know, it says how immorality leads to unbelief. And he talks about the patterns of how people become atheists. And he says, a lot of them have a lot of questions, a lot of skeptical questions. But if you look at their lives, there's always some moral issue that's involved with it too. And the more they go down the route, road of immorality, Whereas they just let immorality sneak into their lives and they just submit to immorality, the more they become hardened, more skeptical, more hardened, um, because sin has really blocked them from experiencing God's love because and their conscience has become seared. So don't doubt the power of sin, how much it can really throw you off in your walk with God. So the way the pattern works, what I've seen with people sometimes when they go from, you know, doubt to completely leading to not that I remember I said the opposite of doubt is an unbelief, but it can lead to unbelief. It is a combination of a hardened heart, disappointment with God. They thought that God was supposed to do something for them. He didn't end up doing it. Factual doubt, meaning they have factual questions about the Bible and other things. They'll talk more about factual doubt in, the, in a minute. And also their spiritual disciplines went down the tube. They stopped praying. They stopped reading the word. Um, they stopped pursuing God. They weren't in community. They weren't in church. All these things combined together just led eventually to unbelief because they're all, it's a lethal combination. So I have seen this happen. Now we talk about factual doubt. That, that is definitely has to do with apologetics. That's where, you know, people have intellectual or factual questions about the Bible, their Bible's reliability. How do we know God exists? What about the reliability of the Bible? What about the resurrection? You know, it, those things are out there and we have answers to those if they're interested. Um, 
it is true. You know, we heard the statement, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know that that is true. Um, but you know, that's why in some cases, very new believers, you mean very new Christians are very on fire for God. They don't know a lot. Just like I would remember at that age, but they're very bold. And it is true that you don't need to know everything to be a strong Christian, but it is true that, um, if people have factual doubt, then there are answers to those things. Like we've done a lot of calls on these topics, like reliability of the Bible, resurrection, reliability of New Testament, you know, who is Jesus? We've covered a lot of topics. So there are answers to those things. And, you know, all of us have to deal with um, sometimes what's called cognitive dissonance. I don't know if you've heard of this. This is where you know, you, you believe something and then you hear something that conflicts with that. Something that challenges what you've always believed. It's called, it's like counter evidence or something. And then you have this dissonance in your mind. You're trying to figure out how to reconcile it. So it's this uncomfortable feeling. It's this uncomfortable, it's this discomfort that, man, I always believe that. I'm hearing something that challenges it. How do I resolve this dissonance? Everybody has this. Atheists have it. People in politics have it with their political views, um, religious people, everybody has it, okay? And the question is how you, you deal with the dissonance. <laughs> but it can be worked through. We just have to have the right tools to work through it. Um, and then there's volitional doubt, just about done here. Volitional doubt has to do with your will. That has to do with, as I said, that has to do with whether you will exercise trust and really exercise faith, you know, where God may challenge you to do something where there's a step of obedience that's required and you have to exercise your will. You have to say, okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust you versus you going the opposite direction and saying, no, I think I know better. And no, I can't trust God here. No, I just can't do that. And that is an aspect of volitional doubt. You doubt the promises of God. You doubt the goodness of God. You doubt God can pull you through that. You doubt God knows what's best. You, you know, when you pray for wisdom, remember God is wisdom. So when he gives you wisdom, that's the way he sees it from his perspective. So either you trust his wisdom or you don't. And obviously that happens to all of us. You see people that doubted in the Bible, they didn't obey God, right? God told them to do something. They didn't do it. Remember Jonah, Jonah's crisis, Jonah, God told Jonah what he wanted to do. Jonah doubted. He didn't trust God. He didn't obey God. He went the opposite direction. God chastened him, right? We see it happen to Abraham. We see it happen to Moses. It happened to uh, uh, people in the New Testament. It happens. It's, it's just human. You know, it's the way we're wired. We don't always trust God. And, um, you know, but there's consequences for that. Now, obviously, some of these doubts overlap. You can have volitional doubt, factual doubt, and emotional doubt. They all can kind of intertwine with the or intermingle with each other. Happens sometimes. They all go together sometimes. There's a great quote by uh, Pascal, the French mathematician, lived a long time ago. He said, in faith, there's enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who doubt. He's right. That God has given enough evidence that he's there for those who want to believe, but certainly also he's made it a little ambiguous so those who don't want to believe can doubt and not believe. He hasn't made himself so avert that people don't have a choice. He wants them to have the choice to follow him. He wants them to have some room to, to figure out if he's there. And, and, you know, he doesn't make it so obvious sometimes he's made it obvious through creation. He's made it obvious through the word of God, through Jesus. But for some people, that's not enough and he'll let them have their way. They can, you know, live in the realm of doubt forever for all he cares. I mean, you know, he wants them to believe, but anyway, so, you know, it comes to like trusting God and exercising your will to think of analogy with a doctor. So if you go to a doctor and the doctor, doctor tells you exercise is good for you. So you think about that. When the doctor tells you either take this drug or I'll give you this prescription, take it because you're sick or else they tell you exercise is good for you. So you, at one point you do acknowledge the doctor, you, you're, you're kind of thinking, okay, the doctor's right. 
I accept these claims as true. He's the authority or she's the authority. Now, doctors, of course, are not always right. But the point is that in most cases, you have to trust the doctor, right? Um, but just knowing what they say, like say, okay, I acknowledge that. You're right, Dr. Smith. You still have to trust. You still have to take a step of faith and either commit to exercise or commit to getting that prescription right and using it properly. And that's the way it is with our faith as well. You know, God gives us the knowledge of what he wants for us in the word of God, but we still have to exercise our will, right? We have to do what the word says. And remember, God cares about the evidence he provides. So God is not just interested in giving us evidence so we can um, argue with him about it all the time. We, he wants us to have active commitment. So, you know, we, um, he's interested in what we do with the evidence, how we handle it. Um, you know, certainly he's not interested in us just playing games with them by God. You, you know, you need to give me more evidence and more evidence and more evidence, not enough and keep testing God. God's already given enough evidence of himself for those who want to believe. Um, he's given him enough to see. So finally, positive things about doubt. God certainly can use doubts to develop us, grow our faith. It can deep, deepen our dependence on God. Um, sometimes it can drive us out of complacency to cause us to search for answers, cause us to dig deeper. Um, it can be really fulfilling when you dig deeper. It can grow your faith and deepen it. Um, but you just have to put in the time and the work into it. So those are some of my thoughts on doubts over the years um, that I dealt with people and dealing with them. Um, one last thing, uh, doubts can certainly cultivate Christian humility within us as we realize everything isn't so black and white. They can help us relate to other people that struggle with doubts. And they also, doubts can also help us uh, grow in our discernment, right? It helps us to filter out what's true and false, right? So there are some positive benefits there. Um, just realize that. So that's about all I have. Um, we'll stop there. I know there's a lot to take in, but there's a lot to talk about.